poison gas supplanted the gallows. In its earliest stages, a microphone was placed inside the sealed death chamber so that scientific observers might hear the words of the dying prisoner to judge how the human reacted in this novel situation. The first inmate was a young black man. As the pellet dropped into the container, and the gas curled upward, through the microphone came these words, Save me, Joe Lewis. Save me, Joe Lewis. Save me, Joe Lewis. It is heartbreaking enough, to ponder the last words of any person dying by force. It is even more poignant to contemplate the words of this boy, because they reveal the helplessness, the loneliness and the profound despair of black people in that period. The condemned young man, groping for someone who might care for him, and had power enough to rescue him, found only the heavyweight boxing champion of the world. I guess he thinks, Joe Lewis would care because he was a young man. Joe Lewis could do something because he was a fighter. In a few words the dying man had written a social commentary. Not God, not government, not charitably minded men, but a young man who was the world's most expert fighter, in this last extremity, was the last hope. The lives of Dr. Charles Peterson and Alan Foster will forever be linked by the intersecting roles that they played in the history of capital punishment methods in North Carolina. Dr. Charles Augustus Peterson was a member of the North Carolina House of Representatives and later state senator in the 1920s, 30s and 40s. Little is known about his life prior to coming to Raleigh to serve as a lawmaker, save for the fact that he was previously a physician from Spruce Pine. Dr. Peterson served his first term in the House of Representatives from 1923 to 1924. A decade later, in 1935, he returned, this time with the announced intention of attempting to substitute lethal gas for the electric chair. He did just that. Within months of his 1935 election, Peterson introduced a bill to change the state's official execution method to lethal gas. The Raleigh News and Observer characterized the bill as his pet project. In her article The Killing Chair, North Carolina's Experiment in Civility and the Execution of Alan Foster. Although Dr. Peterson's motive for advocating lethal gas is largely speculative, his medical background may have greatly influenced his dedication to this issue. The News and Observer noted that Peterson had apparently been corresponding with the wardens of two Western penitentiaries, inquiring as to their success in using lethal gas and whether the wardens believed the method was effective. In March 1935, the Joint Committee on Penal Institutions reviewed Dr. Peterson's lethal gas bill. The committee heard testimony from other physicians and dentists who had considerable experience with anesthetics. The speakers all testified that lethal gas was a more humane method of execution than electrocution. Following the hearing, the committee concluded that the bill should be sent to the floor of the House for a formal vote. The bill was passed by the House and sent to the Senate. The North Carolina Senate voted unanimously on the 1st of May 1935 to replace electrocution with lethal gas. By December 1935, a lethal gas chamber had been erected inside the walls of Central Prison in Raleigh. The installation was seen as a technological innovation, an advance that was met with great optimism by state officials and citizens alike. However, all did not go as planned. Mistakes were made in the gas chamber's first use, the execution of Alan Foster, 
which forced North Carolinians to face the sometimes gruesome business of capital punishment. In the summer of 1935, a 19-year-old inmate, named Alan Foster was transferred from a correctional institution in Birmingham, to the Hope County Civilian Conservation Corps. In North Carolina, Foster's transfer appears to have been a result of Foster's own urging to have Alabama prison officials move him to North Carolina in order to start a new life away from the legal troubles that had plagued him throughout his young life. Alan Foster was sent to work on the prison road gang. According to official North Carolina prison records, Alan Foster escaped from the work camp on the 28th of September 1935. After his escape he assaulted a young white woman in a nearby farmhouse. Foster struck the woman over the head with a glass bottle and then demanded money from the woman. The woman complied by giving Foster five dollars, yet a struggle ensued. What happened next is unclear. In a sworn statement Foster's victim stated that Foster raped her at knife point. Foster denied completion of the act. A medical examination performed later found evidence that the woman was sexually assaulted. Alan Foster was arrested, tried in November 1935, and convicted of the capital felony of rape. Foster's execution date was initially set for the 27th of December 1935. Foster's mother immediately began writing to North Carolina Governor Erringhouse, asking for clemency for her son. Erringhouse briefly stayed Foster's execution so that he could study the matter. However, Foster's reprieve was short-lived. On the 24th of January 1936, Alan Foster was executed, becoming the first capital criminal in North Carolina to die by lethal gas. Despite the optimism for the new official method of state executions as promoted by Dr. Charles Peterson and others, mistakes made during his execution caused Foster to suffer a prolonged death. Due to the near freezing temperature in the gas chamber, the gas failed to work effectively. It took nearly three minutes for Foster to lose consciousness. Even after that, Foster's body continued to convulse wildly for several more minutes before doctors pronounced him dead. The procedure lasted a total of 11 minutes. His last words before he entered the chamber were Goodbye. His lips framed the words so clearly that no man in the witness room could doubt what he had said. As he said it, he winked and then forced a smile at the faces peering in at him. Then he began to suffer. No man could look squarely into his eyes and fail to perceive that they were registering pain. The young man fought for breath, knowing he was going to die and fighting to get it over with as quickly as possible. He sucked the gas desperately until his head rolled back three minutes later, indicating to physicians that the man finally had lost consciousness. But after a period of quiescence, his small, but powerfully built torso began to retch and jerk throwing his head forward on his chest, where witnesses could see his eyes slowly glaze. The tortuous, convulsive retching continued spasmodically for a full four minutes. Officially, it took about 11 minutes for Foster to die, and as those agonizing minutes dragged by a physician broke the witness room's mortified silence by exclaiming, We've got to shorten or get rid of it entirely. Um, yeah? The prison warden was quoted the next day as saying that even hanging was preferable to this. Thank you for watching Death Row.